Hi, everyone, and welcome to Hashtag Event Icons, where you get to chat with the icons of the event industry. My name is Audrey Gallion, and I'll be the host of today's podcast. We're so glad you're spending time with us for the next hour. Today, we're going to be talking about this idea of nonprofit planning. And really, planning for non for profit enterprises is part mindset and large part your heart, right? It requires a, a commitment to the cause and understanding of how to use events to bring in funding for your organization and create that sense of urgency for whatever you're really behind and backing. And we know that the skill sets of executing an event, whether you're a nonprofit or a for-profit, looks the same, except it may be a little bit different to how you get to your goal. You need to be agile. You need to think a little bit differently about how you're spending your money. So today we have two very strong leaders from the space, looking at it actually from a variety of angles, but really with a deep expertise around how do you market for growth and ultimately make your organizations shine. We are so excited because we're coming in with a wide range of ideas and we of course want to hear from you. So let's go ahead and jump right in. It's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, so you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons, presented by Endless Events. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. Use the question panel on the webinar to submit your questions, or you can hop on Twitter, submit your questions with hashtag event icons. We'll be answering your questions live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better conversation we can have. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter and Facebook. Just tell your friends to watch at www.event-icons.com. Com. Now, without any further delay, this is Hashtag Event Icons. Welcome again to today's episode. My name is Audrey Gallion, and I will be your host and talking about nonprofit planning. Today, I'm joined by two fantastic panelists. First and foremost, we have Megan Kincaid Kramer. Megan has run the Catalyst Awards Conference and Dinner, which is basically the Oscars of the corporate diversity and inclusion world for 14 years. She has an incredible mind and is an innovator in getting things done for a nonprofit, especially in a space that is so corporate facing that it has to kind of navigate multiple identities. So welcome, Megan. We're so excited to have you. Thanks. Glad to be here. And we also have Kelsey Boyle, who is truly a marketer's mind with a designer's eye. Kelsey, Kelsey has spent the past decade running communication strategies for mission-based driven startups across a seemingly random selection of industries, sustainable seafood, angel investing, fair trade apparel, contraceptive products, and most recently, international development. So Kelsey, we're so happy to have you to bring your insights today. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, sure thing. And so for those who are listening live, just a friendly reminder to join the conversation via the chat on event-icons.com in the Event Icons Facebook group, or you can talk to us on Twitter at hashtag event icons. But without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right in. So we always like to start our podcast out with just a really simple question. If you weren't doing what you're doing today, what would you be doing? Whether it's being in the event industry or serving nonprofit planning in some capacity. So Megan, I would love to start with you. What would you be doing? Sure. And how did you get to where you are? Okay. Um, so I, I think it was sort of inevitable that I would be in the event space eventually. I was always kind of that person within a group of friends who was rallying the troops around some sort of outing or idea. Um, so I think that that just sort of uh, was my, my destiny there. And I, um, I did work in the for-profit, the very for-profit executive recruiting space for a while. Um, I realized that that was not for me. Um, I wasn't motivated by money. I wanted to be with a mission-based organization and doing work that advanced uh, public good. So found myself at Catalyst. I've been with Catalyst for 14 years now. And um, as you mentioned, run the largest signature event that we do. And I think if I were not doing events, um, 
I would definitely be doing something that's all around the outcome. So for Mm -hmm. me, what's personally rewarding is being there at the event, seeing all of that hard work come to fruition. So I think I would probably be doing something where, I don't know, I'd go to culinary school and be a chef and, you know, have have that same sort of outcome um, creative with your creative work. Absolutely. I mean, I think that is one of the most special parts of event planning is all of that upfront work, all of the complication and planning, and then seeing it happen live. The second that ends, the event ends, you're kind of ready to do it again. Yes, <laughs> and exactly. when you're in the middle of it, you say, I'm never going to do this ever again. So it, I yeah. love it. It's uh, that's, that's spot on. Kelsey, what about you? Where did you, where did you get to or what brought you to where you are today? And if you were to do something different, what would you do? Sure. So, um, I'm a little bit of, a, of cheating because uh, event planning isn't my full-time gig. Um, I'm mostly in the communication space, but largely involved in event planning. And I sort of fell into it. Um, all of the organizations I've been with in the past, you know, all of that from sustainable seafood on, um, events have always been part and parcel to part of our engagement with the community. And um, most recently at Women Deliver, we host the largest uh, international conference focused on gender equality and the health and rights of girls and women. It happens every three years. So it's a large undertaking with um, an even larger runway. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's like Megan said, extremely fulfilling, especially uh, at the moment to, to see everyone come together. Uh, we bring over 6,000 people together under one roof. And this year we have the ultimate goal of bringing 100,000 online virtually. So so if I wasn't doing this extremely important conference, I think I would be using my marketing chops in a different way. Um, I'm very interested in behavior change communications. And so I think I'd probably do more PSAs, those sort of those activities. Or I'd be doing graphic design full time. It's something I don't have much time for these days. Nice. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm such a behavior change geek. So (laughs) you're a good company. (laughs) We all are here. And I think that's what brings a lot of folks to mission based work is, especially in the creation of events is how do you bring someone through an experience where they leave change in some capacity, and sustainably so right not just supporting the mission, but leaving better as a person. And every event achieves that in some capacity. But the stakes for mission-based planning are usually pretty high. And I think that that's really interesting from a planner's perspective. So Megan, I know that, and I know very well that Catalyst is <laughs> so much more than conference and awards, but I do want to start with the specific signature event that you run and tell us a little bit more about the mission of the organization and how this event really became Catalyst North Star. Absolutely. So um, as, as, you know, Audrey, (laughs) Catalyst is so much more. And um, for those listening in, Catalyst is the leading nonprofit that works to advance women in the workplace. And so our uh, mission is to build inclusive workplaces through advancing women. And our, uh, our vision is workplaces that work for women. And uh, the organization was founded actually in 1962. So quite some time ago when women were in a very different space in this country um, by a woman named Felice Schwartz at her kitchen table in Ohio. And so she, she really was interested at that point at getting women into the workforce. Since then we've, we've evolved uh, tremendously. So uh, we have uh, over 800 corporate supporters and mostly those are fortune 500 organizations that are investing in our mission and our work and really wanting to become inclusive as they can be themselves and and working to advance women within their respective workplaces and what we do is each year and for the past 30 years or so we've awarded the catalyst award and that's to organizations that have sustainable initiatives to ed, uh, recruit, advance, and develop women uh, within their organizations. And these really run the gamut um, from very small law firms with uh, uh, an exciting initiative to multinational corporations where they're um, 
touching many different uh, employees' lives all over the globe with the same initiative. So um, our awards, conference, and dinner spotlights these initiatives. That really is our organization's North Star. We want to show these as best in class, and we want to show these winners as being um, organizations and initiatives that others should aspire to become. And we want to give the attendees at these events not only the inspiration to make those changes within their own workplaces, but also the tools to make those happen. So we do a lot just around um, the rigor of the award. It is a year-long process um, whereby companies apply. They have uh, individuals go on site visits and conduct focus groups and that sort of thing. And um, and yeah, it's it's become a very big part of our organization's uh, financial picture as well. It contributes about 28% of the organization's uh, annual budget. So it it is one day where there's a lot of pressure for things to go well. <laughs> no pressure at all. No. <laughs> yeah, well, I think what's, what's really interesting too about the Catalyst Award is that that has become such a keystone part of the brand of the organization and how mm -hmm. it's seen externally, although that's not something that it always offered. And I Absolutely. think that, you know, with any event, whether you're nonprofit planning or for profit, that is such a key part is not just showcasing a product or activation, but actually bringing people into a key part of the brand and the story. Um, so that, that's really great. And Kelsey, you know, you, you do have very much have a diverse range of experience. Can you tell us what that common factor has been for you um, to keep you engaged in nonprofits and in a variety of capacities? Sure. Well, the obvious answer is, of course, the good causes. It's such a motivator to go to work every day and know that uh, at, that you're not just working for yourself or your organization, but for a larger cause. Um, but I would say another common uh, a commonality with all my experiences are the gender is the gender aspect. Um, mm. Even when I was in the angel investing space, uh, we had quite a lot of interest in in finding seed funding for mission driven startups that were run by women, and tapping into the angel investor network that were women of of means themselves. So that was, of course, a, a big motivator for me to see where women can do investing themselves. Um, and then now in uh, the global advocacy space, uh, gender is really what Women Deliver does. And I think another common thread is these activation moments. So uh, when I was selling seafood, it was the Boston Seafood Show. Uh, when I was uh, selling contraceptive products, it was going to things like the gynecological um, events and being able to have that face-to-face -face interaction with people, especially in the global space, is something that is so fulfilling. Mm. So it sounds like we all care about what we do. <laughs> we got that covered. And what about, and I do want to kind of just dive into the logistics world of nonprofit planning. And because I do think it's really interesting, particularly for our listeners, you know, we all come in with a range of budgets, a range of goals for every single event to execute. Um, and Megan, I'm just curious, especially having managed this event for 14 years, you've probably seen the conversation with corporate sponsors with mm -hmm. um, preferred event space and having, you know, a hotel that you're building trust with for a long time. What has been kind of your keys to success that really does make nonprofit planning uh, unique in a lot of ways? Yeah, I mean, I would just say that we're very lucky in uh, the Catalyst space in that the audience that we're bringing to the event has value. So where we might not be making the investments with the hotel, getting that extra long open bar or doing something really great in terms of lighting or, you know, those kinds of things, um, which, which are all fun to do, um, that we're, we're bringing the potential for others to be coming and having their events at, at their space. So I always try to play that up. Um, additionally, I think it's with our, our sponsors, it's really looking for what their goals are along the corporate social responsibility line. So um, a few years ago, um, we had Target Corporation as a sponsor uh, for our conference and um, uh, environmental causes are big to their, uh, their corporate so social responsibility. So what we did is um, they actually had 
branded water bottles that they brought in. We had water coolers rather than having the reusable or the, uh, you know, throwaway bottles at the event. So mm. um, I think that there's, there's just ways that you can kind of think about what it is that your sponsors looking to highlight in terms of their commitment to a cause, maybe not specifically the cause that your event is for, but what are some creative ways that you can brainstorm together to make that highlighted to your attendees, to make it evident, and to put that spotlight on your sponsor to show that they're, you know, out there changing the world in their own way. Um, I, you know, I, I think about another uh which you'll know very well, Audrey, we we had our event on International Women's Day several years ago, and we really wanted to position our organization as being a, a convening place and our event being a convening place for like-minded organizations that were also working in the gender space. So um, we ha- tapped UPS, who had been a longtime sponsor. They uh, they you know, knew that they wanted to sponsor for us, but we put together a customized proposal um, because what they really wanted to do was highlight their community partnerships. So we were able to get some of their community partners there in our exhibit hall. They provided the funding for it and we were able to connect with many more organizations um, as a result of that. So I think it's just with, uh, you know, with the nonprofit space, um, I, I always use that the very first, you know, line that we're talking about as we look to external vendors as well, we're a nonprofit. So, you know, (laughs) Um, and, and I think that, you know, they're um, for other organizations when they are giving you those um, services, sometimes in a pro bono fashion, it's a tax break for them too. So that's, you know, something to, to always look into and highlight if possible. um, And, you know, really just try to, put the focus on um, how their good work is helping advance, you know, their cause and put a spotlight on their organization as being committed to the cause. Yeah, that's great. And I think that's something that has really impressed me with Catalyst too, is just continually reaching out to other mission-based organizations, other partners that are doing great work and being, to use your words, a convener for Um, kind of just expanding the platform. And that makes it a lot easier to have that reach, to bring in sponsors, to see themselves in, if they don't exactly fit in the mission that you have in that moment, they still have buy-in in some capacity because the doors open for them to get visibility on, for UPS as an example, just the amazing work that they've done using drones to transfer blood infusions across areas that weren't safe to drive through. I mean, what an incredible story that doesn't exactly have to do with Catalyst Mission. Um, and I think, Kelsey, that makes me think, too, about the, the mission of Women Deliver. And I mean, for that, a 4,000 person event with a small nonprofit executing, I'm assuming that relies on some pretty, pretty strong external partnerships or perhaps a bit of autonomy of who is actually making the event come to life. I'd love to learn more about that. Yeah, that's right. And actually, we're hoping for 7,000 on site this time. Um, nice. But yes, yeah, so partnership is, is really key to executing a Women Deliver event. Uh, and something a, a little unique, um, the way that we plan our, our events is we control the programming of what happens on the main stage and what happens um, in special events, so, such as our, um, our film festival. But those breakout sessions that happen three times a day that really dive deep into specific issues, whether that's gender-based violence or how women are, are climate justice warriors, those we look to our really wide network of experts. So we actually hand over the reins to more than, I think we're now at 130 partner organizations that are actively involved in putting the programming together for these concurrent sessions. Uh, and of course, we, we are able to, to vet and to give speaker recommendations and to see where it best fits in the program. It's a very collaborative um, undertaking, but it's also so important to be able to keep the right pulse on what our community is after. Uh, and it just, it's a win-win for everybody because we have a lot of other like-minded NGOs, nonprofits um, that, that want to get involved somehow and have a lot to offer. But again, their budgets are very small, like all of ours are, and they can validate going to a conference, sending their staff if they have a speaking role 
or if they have an organizing role, it becomes a much easier sell for them. And so it's, it's something that we've done from the very beginning, um, especially as a very small staff. We used to run our, organ our um, organization with a group of 10. We're now finally up to 50 staff full time, but it's still, still quite a large undertaking. We really need the partnership approach. I did want to also say that this partnership approach is also something that, that we carry over to our sponsors and donors. So very similar to Catalyst, we find those mutually beneficial arrangements. Um, and I, I love the idea of finding areas for, um, for corporations to shine. So for instance, we, one little bit of programming that we do is a social enterprise pitch um, where we put 10, 10 entrepreneurs up against one another to, to pitch um, for some seed funding. And uh, Chanel actually has a foundation branch that they're starting to do incubator work. And so what a perfect opportunity for them to, to sponsor that stage, to have that special branding, special recognition and the press around it. It, it just makes a lot of sense. And because our exhibition hall is more than an exhibition hall, we actually call it a fueling station. We put stages in there. Um, we obviously put all the coffee and food, so lots of traffic there. But it becomes a place that is about more than selling, even though sometimes in the nonprofit space, selling is selling a mission. Um, it's really a place for dialogue. And so, uh, you know, we work with a lot of pharmaceuticals that are typically in the women's health space, but some of their programs are extremely mission driven and it's a great opportunity for them to showcase their videos to bring frontline health worker staff to the event that's something that that we really think of with our partnerships is who else deserves to be in the room mm, absolutely yeah i love that kelsey i think that that's spot on and it, it also just kind of for me and something I'm constantly looking back on the, the years that we've been doing this work is how corporations may be changing what they're expecting, what their expectations are in supporting a nonprofit event, especially, you know, for nonprofits partnering with each other, it's making sure you have a platform for your mission. Corporations have a variety of, of buy-in for why they want to be involved. Very similar to, to for-profit events, right? Mm -hmm. But with nonprofits too, I think that the expectation of what you get out of sponsorship, what you get out of your involvement may have evolved as well. Um, for example, maybe it's not just getting some, some visibility on a panel, or maybe it is really about sharing stories and videos and going beyond a traditional sponsorship. I don't know, Megan, if you look back over you know, a 10, 10 year span, if you've seen oh, yeah. that evolution as well. Absolutely. I feel like, you know, um, in the early years, it was kind of like, okay, we have your logo now. Great. We're going to put it on everything and then we're done. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's great. Thank you for the money. And, and that's, uh, we're, we're done here. But I, I really has evolved. I mean, um, you know, I, I would say even in the past, let's say three to five years, I mean, there, there's the whole social aspect as well. And, you know, really wanting to make sure that um, if they have some social campaign that we're tying into our event that, you know, if they are um, wanting to do something on Facebook Live that we're equipped to do that. I mean, it's, it's really, it has definitely evolved. And I think um, for our sponsors that the, the competition is there too. Um, they have, you know, so many dollars that they are going to be investing and they want to make sure that what they're investing in, they're going to be getting the best return on that investment. Um, so they are wanting to, you know, um, have that engagement with the audience, not only during the event, but also before and after. So thinking about creative ways to do that. And, you know, I, as I said, I think social is a big part of that. Um, and it is, it is about, you know, really telling that, that story that they would like to tell um, and making sure that the, the opportunity as Kelsey, as Kelsey mentioned is, it is a good fit with them. And I think that that, that's something that, um, you know, it's, it's definitely been an evolution over the past 14 years that um, I've been <laughs> doing this one signature event, for sure. I, I do want to say that people should be aware of it. Uh, nonprofits should be aware of it because it takes a lot more effort to make sure 
that your partners, your donors, your sponsors are, are really feeling that they're, their needs are being met. And I think with that, that extra hand holding, that extra really thinking of before, during and after, um, I think the packages should reflect that. And so I, I know Women Deliver is, is very cognizant of this change. And when we approach sponsors, we approach them with also core funding for being a partner in the long term, not just a one-off event, because if they are bought into the mission of the event, they're obviously bought into the mission of the organization. And why not have a partnership that, that provides more benefit for both parties in the long term? Absolutely. And that, that is something that I wanted to ask you both is, do you see really nice rollover and expectation of rollover of engagement after an event ends with an organization. So you're sponsoring this and in the next year or two, here's our, here's our plan for you. Kelsey, you're nodding. Would you have thoughts on that? <laughs> yes, somewhat. Um, I think, I think the virtual component lends itself really well to that. Um, so, so we, this, this year have really started to think about our satellite events as well. Um, and these are also happening uh, post event. So in addition to the programming that goes on, the programming that goes on for our virtual conference, uh, we also want to extend it. And I think an easy way to extend the programming and the learnings that come after the conference is using those partners that have the larger networks that have space that could host, you know, an open dialogue in their corporate offices. If they have other funding sites, perhaps internationally, if, there are local communities that they can gather and be able to, to give their learnings to a larger group. Many times after our conference, um, in our post-conference survey or in our post-conference sort of call to action, we encourage all of our delegates, and this goes even beyond our, our donors, uh, to make sure that they spread the knowledge and we give them toolkits to do that. But, but of course, it, it is something that, that all of the financial partners should be willing and able to do as well from the get-go. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just thinking through, you know, just some of the um, opportunity for engagement with those who are speaking on panels. Um, we have had in the past on more than one occasion, somebody who, you know, just kind of got thrown into this event. They, you know, were didn't maybe know exactly what Catalyst was all about and following were impressed and, you know, joined on as board members. So, you know, really using the event itself as an opportunity to um, build those relationships that can take you into the future through board service, through, as Kelsey said, through, you know, additional satellite events. Um, you, you really don't know who's in the room, but you have to prepare for, you know, um, extending the event and the impact of the event beyond just that room. That's great. And I, I, that makes me think too about the, just how much we in the nonprofit space are balancing who your key stakeholders are. So let's say that you want to engage every level of an organization. Maybe you create customized paths for different levels or expertise or interests. I mean, Women Deliver covers so much ground and too. I mean, it's just, it's really interesting. But then you also have to make sure that you are engaging folks that are high up in organizations, preferably the C-suite, because they are the ones driving particular, I mean, of course they drive the business, but the, the mission-based work and where to invest has so much fluidity. You know, and Megan, you mentioned the competition, right? So corporations are looking for just a handful of partners on an annual basis. And it really comes down to how high up in the organization you have folks speaking on your behalf. And Megan, I'm thinking about um, the Champions for Change initiative mm -hmm. that is providing CEOs a platform towards the mission, but also probably driving engagement in events where you're trying to execute major fundraising. Have you seen that have an effect um, or are you able to achieve with all levels of an organization? Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think, you know, for many, many years, our Catalyst Awards dinner, we have the CEO of the award-winning organization accept the award on the organization's behalf. And we have what we call our day of stage of, you know, 100 CEOs um, 
So it's it, it was really a natural extension of that. Um, we've seen at Catalyst, and our research confirms that when there's commitment at the top, that trickles down as far as inclusion. Um, when it's baked into you know, business units accountability baked into the goals, uh, diversity measures that are being done, that are being paid attention to. Um, when it's on the CEO's agenda, it gets done. So I think that, you know, with the CEO Champions for Change, it was it was a natural extension and a nice way for us to continue to, to engage with that population because as we do see, they, they do have a tremendous amount of influence. Um, with that being said, it's, uh, I think, important for our organization, we um, we do try to create content for all levels. So this past year at our conference, we said, okay, we we have the majority of our attendees at our conference are from the diversity and inclusion uh, practitioner space. So we know we've got that content covered, but how is it that we can create content so they are bringing those who they might be reporting to at the executive level and so that they are bringing those from um, the next generation who are those high potentials who will be the leaders mm. of these organizations in say another 10 years. Um, so we had an executive level track and a high potential track. and. Um, uh, emerging leader track. So um, I think that, you know, there it is important to, of course, um, build those relationships and have that sort of um, uh, investment in the the top of the organization as far as making those relationships. But I do think that it's important because um, I think that we've seen at Catalyst, a lot of the change that comes with initiatives is more at the grassroots level, is more at, you know, a bubble up rather than a top down approach. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. I am in complete agreement with that. I think uh, sometimes the Women Deliver conferences struggle with, with the opposite, with having too many C-suites uh, wanting the stage. And mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a conference that is about advocacy and is much, much about grassroots activism, uh, it is essential for us to have that even playing field. And what I've been really struck by with Women Deliver conferences is that egalitarian feel. You know, we, we might have had a head of state uh, plan to come in just for their keynote and, and leave, but they get a sense of the room and they end up walking around for two days. They change their plans, they stay. And I think it's a magical thing that happens. And it has to be part of the planning though. It has to be about that level setting at the beginning. We of course want, um, we want the corporates to be involved at a high level. We ensure that we have pre-conferences. We have a private sector pre-conference, a ministerial and parliamentarian pre-conference. So they can be in the room together and really dig into the issues that they need to tackle as a community. But the rest of the event is for everybody. And our commitment is to put 30% at least of our speakers um, on stage under the age of 30. Uh, and, I've, and it's also part of our budgeting process. Uh, we, we designate at least 40% of our budget to scholarships to bring people who could not afford to, to attend the conference on their own. We pay for the registration, their travel and their hotel accommodations and a per diem. And, that's what helps create the atmosphere that is so different um, that you don't get at every other event with the highest level and the grassroots level speaking together, coming to solutions together. I love this attendee pipeline and key stakeholders pipeline. I've never thought about it in this way. It makes perfect sense. That's awesome. Um, I have kind of a curveball question for you too. I'm wondering if we see limitations in being a nonprofit and planning, right? So if there is kind of a, oh, we can't do that because we're a nonprofit. And that may even be how you execute the event, not necessarily limited funding, which is the traditional way to think about nonprofit planning. But, you know, for our conversation today, we haven't once talked about the limitation of funding, right? It is really about how do you drive missions strategically with sponsors, with key stakeholders, but Curious if you have found some roadblocks or limitations along the way because of being a nonprofit and how you've negotiated that. Megan, do you mind if I start with you? Sure, yeah. So, um, uh, with our nonprofit and all nonprofits, um, just the the political leanings and and having those types of conversations um, that's been you know a bit a bit challenging where we, there's a speaker we really want to go after and we really want to get there in the room and we're told no actually it would hurt our status as a nonprofit 
<laughs> to try and go that route. So, um, and, and, you know, there have been um, various speakers that we have had where it is sort of, um, we've tempered that content to make it fit in a, in a more meaningful way with the overall frame of the day and that kind of thing. But um, I would say that that's, that's one of the roadblocks that, you know, aside from funding that, that we've seen in the nonprofit space. Yeah, I mean, obviously funding, we can get into that in a little bit, but um, I think for the, the international space too, so not just as a nonprofit, but, but as an event that is supposed to be inclusive of the entire world, um, that puts a lot of limitations on us as well. Uh, we need to be sensitive to languages. Um, since we are hosting in Canada this time around, uh, the entire conference is bilingual in French and English, but we also are choosing to, to translate our plenaries and and select concurrence to Spanish and Arabic and perhaps uh, Mandarin as well. Um, but also, you know, as, as a leading nonprofit who is all about uh, youth engagement, meaningful youth engagement, that, that choice to, to put young people on stage means a lot of, a lot of prep. So many people are doing incredible work, but they might not be camera ready, for instance. And that's okay that we're worth, they're worth the investment, but that's a consideration. Um, and, you know, just that politics, sure. Um, and when you're talking on the, the global scale and you're talking about collaborating with 130 different <laughs> organizations, <laughs> politics are everywhere. Yeah. Um, but I think you have to just be really strong about what your, your mission is, your values as an organization. And make sure that you're transparent up front. You know, we, we might work with, we do, we unapologetically work with the private sector and we see them as core partners and change makers for girls and women. But some of our, uh, some of our organizations that we partner with on the concurrent sessions might not feel that way. Mm -hmm. But that's okay because conferences need to be a place of dialogue and having tough conversations and challenging assumptions. And I think that you know, you can turn that challenge into an opportunity for learning. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great point. I mean, it really is all about the positioning and the strategy. I mean, we've been and uh, careful about bringing politicians in, but certainly have done it. And mm -hmm. it's kind of opportunistic, too, because the same politician, depending on the year, might have a great platform, and then the next year might not. And you're kind of negotiating those key moments to bring people in and give them a voice. Um, but being, I think, the advantage of being a nonprofit is the position of we're just a convener for dialogue and mm -hmm. even stepping back from expertise too and saying this is the space for us to kind of push back with each other if we want to. I mean, in the diversity and inclusion space, the two top trending topics in the world are unconscious bias and sexual harassment. And, and that comes up in every single session and making sure that we're ready to have that dialogue, that we have speakers that are prepped. That's, you know, Megan, I think about the 2018 Catalyst Awards. I feel like every speaker was ready to kind of be prepped on those tough questions. Um, and that's interesting in, in a nonprofit space because we're not talking about, you know, the pitfalls of a, a product launch or, you know, what kind of market positioning that may have, but what's at stake for people and humans and, you know, just our lives and women deliver obviously is a huge proponent of that. So I can imagine that you're also doing a lot of navigation around how far do we go and what is the kind of backbone behind conversations. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I think a lot of that has to do with where we choose to host our, our conferences. Mm. So the choice of Vancouver, uh, Canada, was not just about logistics, because there are very few spaces that can do a conference of our size. Um, but it's about the willingness um, of the government to be in support of the messages that they know that we're going to be spreading. Um, and we have we have a, a key partner in, in Prime Minister Trudeau. So it seems like a really good fit for us uh, because censorship is not what we're about. Uh, and we just have to be prepared for, for those moments. Well, good crisis communication plan, but also know that, that you're in the right place to have those conversations. It also um, is a consideration with our scholarship program um, in making sure that 
we bring people who maybe have more censorship in their home countries, um, but this is a space that mm. they can actually share their, their perspective. That's great. So do we want to talk about what happens when you don't have money? <laughs> <laughs> on workarounds for it. I've sure. seen very creative things in my day. Um, maybe we have memories of some most creative moments. Of, and I think, again, all of this conversation is true for for-profit and non-profit planners. But Megan, I'm curious if there has been some kind of savvy workarounds that you've learned over the years. I do know you are a master negotiator of contract. <laughs> Yes, uh, the, negotiating the contracts, but I will say, so um, this summer I actually got involved with some just grassroots event planning in my own local community around um, the reunite families um, mm -hmm. and immigration crisis. And that was, I mean, that was a real like, okay, we really don't have money here. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was, you know, it was like, hallelujah, somebody gave us $30 so we can buy, you know, like the, the paper <laughs> to make the photocopies. So, um, you know, I mean, that was, I think, it, it, and it's, and it's a range, right? It's, um, you know, I, I think we've talked a little bit about sort of the, the opportunities to um, really highlight uh a vendor or a partner or a corporate sponsor in a way where they're doing something pro bono that feels like it really fits with the event. Um, and I think too, there's, you know, um, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, our, our event, it's, uh, so it's a, it's not quite as big as the, the event Kelsey pulls off, but we've got 1,500 people who come to the dinner, 800 to the conference. It's all on one day. Um, and we, we rely heavily on our, our own staff to be the people who are, you know, directing people um, to their sessions, to checking them in, getting them their badges, that kind of thing. So I think that you know, um, in terms of, I, uh, I, I'm going to have to think some more. This is a curveball question. <laughs> it is. I'm sorry. I've been, this has been an, an entire coming to mind. of curveball questions. <laughs> I'm just so in the moment right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll say I've seen, I've seen Megan do many things to work around crisis situations because it's been so high stakes with sponsors to make <laughs> quick switches and, um, you know, just like any amazing event planner, making magic happen in the moment. Um, <laughs> that's what it is, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, being able to do so. Kelsey, have you seen any kind of unique navigation from the wide range of, of work that you've done? Um, well, I think leaning in to the nonprofit story can open up a lot of doors. I think in that negotiation process is so key. We, we actually... Um, we worked so closely with our, um, the event director of the, the venue from our 2016 conference in Copenhagen that we snatched her and brought her on full time um, to be our events ninja uh, here. And she's already, you know, saved us millions of dollars in contracting alone, which is, which is just incredible to me. Um, but I think, I think it's all about the staff, about how many uh, how many people you can bring on board that can fill gaps in in real time? I think all of the people on my team may be you know assigned to specific verticals, but if push comes to shove, they're the ones handling our social media. They're the ones uh, working out tech issues in the background. Um, and I think it's that willingness for your staff to to be all hands on deck uh, is is really key as well. But yes, leaning into that into that nonprofit mission story for pro bono. Uh, we are trying to get um, tablets right now, pro bono, uh, because we're gonna go paperless um, as an environmental concern. So our, so, you know, we're, we're attempting that right now, but uh, had, had a lot of success, you know, with maybe some out of the box sponsorships that you mm -hmm. wouldn't think of, maybe um, airlines that would want to give specific discounts, especially to our sponsored delegates that are coming from many places around the world. Mm. Um, you know, looking outside the conference center too. Uh, so we're working with the city of Vancouver to see what sort of elements uh, related to gender equality that they want highlighted. And for exchange, maybe we get free bus passes for all of our delegates. You know, just, just trying to think outside of the box and outside of the convention center um, can, can spark a lot. 
Yeah, I think that I've seen that too, of just like being really creative about going, going outside of the usual, here's our asks for sponsorship and, and just seeing and knowing what's important for the city, a corporation in that moment and bringing your story and your mission to whatever their goals are. That's been really effective. And Megan, I've seen creative sponsorships happen along the way outside of okay, you're sponsoring this track, thanks. And you're sponsoring the dinner, great, thanks. Here's, you know, 10 minutes to talk. So that, yeah, that absolutely makes a lot of sense. I want to talk and switch gears a little bit and think about communication strategy. And I know, Kelsey, you bring so much expertise. And Megan, having worn many hats at Catalyst and be, needing to, to manage communication or think about creative communication, for the Catalyst Awards Conference and Dinner. How has that evolved over the years, thinking both internally and externally, and just how important strong communication is for a nonprofit event? Yeah, I think, um, I think it starts with making sure that the entire staff uh, really understands the, the goals from the beginning. I think we've been talking internally a lot about legacy and starting our conversations from, from that point. So, you know, we've, we've designated a few of them, but a couple that come to mind. Um, our theme is power progress change. And so we're really focusing all of our programming around the notion of power and women in power. And when we start with a legacy outcome that we want to change the perception of power and power in relation to women, that drives our communication strategies. So that drives um, our promotion plans about who we want in the room, the types of messages we want to soft sound with them before they even get there, the types of talking points that we equip our staff with as they go out to, um, to various events and meetings with stakeholders. Um, but it's also, uh, you know, another key part about the communication strategy is, is tapping that network that we know we're going to be relying on so heavily for the programming uh, early on. So we spent, um, I think it was eight, eight or nine months doing a global listening tour. And we did this in person and online uh, before we even put pen to paper uh, with any of the programming. So our CEO traveled the world. Uh, she spoke in board or she went to board meetings. She went to uh, local community events uh, in the global south and she wanted to hear exactly what issues were the most pertinent to, to women around the world. And so we started from there. We started with listening and then we, we form all of our communications around that. Then we think about our legacy. Then we work on the talking points. We work on the op-ed strategy. We do all the social media plans and all the drum beats, and we work out those calendars of publications. But uh, I think I think really starting about what you want to achieve first um, is a great way to guide. That's Absolutely. awesome. I love that. I love yeah. I love leading with legacy. Megan, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, to Kelsey's point, it is that end in mind. Um, so as we got into our, our events and annual events, so as we got into the planning for this year, we of course took feedback from last year. We did a similar listening tour. It wasn't all around the globe, but we tapped key players and stakeholders and, and you know, asked, asked their thinking. And, and one of the fun questions we asked this year is, you know, just around moonshot thinking. Like if there weren't any of those nonprofit mm -hmm. sort of limitations that we are always running into, what would you like to see as a key feature of this event. So that gave us, um, you know, some really wacky ideas that, you know, might not happen, but <laughs> also gave us some food for thought. So um, it is that thinking about the end of mind. It's, it's really thinking about, um, you know, the attendee experience when the attendee walks out the door from your event at the end of that evening. What do you want them thinking, feeling, doing, um, and really starting from there. And, you know, as, as Kelsey said, I think a cohesive theme is really helpful. That's something that um, I will admit, I, I would say we've probably only had for the last five years at Catalyst. Like we didn't really even have a theme for our event. This is our first time, so you know? don't feel bad about yeah, that. <laughs> so I mean, it, it's, and it's just, and it really does. It, it creates that experience it gives you like that north star to go back to and say like how is this tying to the theme let's think about the theme framework and how we're um, relating back to that and so I think that that's um, you know from the the communications 
side too. It gets people excited too. It's great to sort of have that boilerplate and have people with their talking points and equip our own staff um, to be able to talk about, you know, the event and, and help them to get people there. And I think uh, it's so fun to do surveys because the nuggets you can get out of there, that's communication pieces in themselves. So with our listening tour as well, we, we had plenty of fodder to just keep the, keep the conference in the front of people's minds. Perhaps we haven't made any decisions, but we can say we heard from you. And yeah. this is what you said. <laughs> this is what's trending. Here's the live poll. Um, it's it, just realizing all these moments and splitting them up in a way that can just keep the momentum is, is absolutely crucial. So, you know, we do different speaker announcements. That's very typical of conferences, but we're also all of our, um, our open calls for, you know, digital posters that launched this week. Next week will be, um, you know, mobile app, appy hour sort of uh, mm -hmm. submissions. And so just making sure that we have this constant drum beat that is somewhat promotional, but also, again, is adding to the legacy because the, the messaging is always the same. Uh, it's posters about advocacy to change the perception of girls and women. So, you know, it's, it's a long run, but um, is both internal and external in traditional media and also new media. Absolutely. Yeah. Constantly evolving. Well, hey, we just got a question in from one of our listeners, which I think is a great one because we do get quite a lot of vendors who listen in too. And so there's so many different key players to make an event happen. The question is, how can vendors work with nonprofits to find a win-win where vendors make money, but still allowing nonprofits to save on the budget? And Megan, do you have experience with this? Um, yeah, I mean, we've had different, um, you know, parts, uh, vendors that we've worked with, we've actually looked to our sponsors to underwrite those costs. So we want to do something really exciting in terms of lighting design. But you know, that wasn't initially in our budget. But can we find, you know, um, I don't know, I'm blanking on <laughs> who it was, but can we find a, uh, one of our corporate partners to underwrite those costs? So I think that that's um, part of it. And, you know, at the end of the day, too, it is, it's, um, it is, uh, it, of course, we understand that vendors want to, to make the profit as well. And, um, you know, we want to be good partners. Can we um, connect them with, you know, one of our um uh, corporate partners that they're looking to do business with? Can we, mm -hmm. you know, provide that bri bridge? Can we be helpful? Um, you know, certainly promoting their services among our attendees, that kind of thing. So it sounds like don't, if you're, if you're an external vendor, don't hesitate to reach out to nonprofits because if we want some amazing projection mapping, we'll find a sponsor to cover the, <laughs> cover the cost. Right. Okay, we're very crafty that way in the yeah. nonprofit world. <laughs> Kelsey, what about you? Have you seen some creative vendor engagement? Yeah, I think we, we do all the things that, that Megan, Megan mentioned. Um, but I'd also say, again, back to the story of the nonprofit about the mission, I think vendors can approach just as our sponsors and donors approach it. And mm -hmm. once you partner, that's your story about that partnership that you can market to till the cows come home. You know, that, that can be, again, part of your brand building. Um, to say that you work with nonprofits and for profits alike because it's something that you believe in. I think that opens up a lot of doors. You'd be surprised. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's been, you know, looking at vendors outside of just, okay, will you execute this, but can we bring you into the story, give you a little bit more visibility. Um, you know, it's so funny. I, I think about, you know, working in the diversity and inclusion space for so many years and how many amazing conversations I've had with AV people after being mm. in the room of our sessions and just, wow, I was, that was really great. I was really, I learned some things. And mm -hmm. uh, in fact, just this week I was in um, St. Louis running a session and the AV guy ended up doing his, his own self-assessment and was participating fully. And it was just this really cool experience where I think that in general, nonprofit, for-profit, you can really bring vendors in to be part of it. Um, and it just makes the experience better for everyone. And we see a lot of um, you know, folks in, in smaller organizations switching gears from just being a service to more end to end in living the brand. So that makes a ton of sense. Um, well, I wanted to ask you all too, if 
there are any amazing leaders that you've seen in the space of nonprofits of just really some, some great wish list execution for a nonprofit or maybe something that you would want to see happen for nonprofit organizations in the planning space in the future. Have you, have you thought about what that might look like even five to 10 years from now? Hmm. I guess the first thing that comes to mind because it's on my to-do list is the virtual interaction. So obviously the technology that that is available these days um, makes it so much more of a possibility, but I don't think we've really cracked the nut of the, the back and forth communication of really making a conversation virtually. Uh, it's, it's so much easier to just broadcast out. Um, and so I think especially with, international nonprofits like mine, um, or those who are trying to reach across borders or different sectors, I think really designing more virtual interaction um, in addition to the on-site and somehow integrating the two is something that I see the industry moving towards, but something that I'd like to see even quicker. I don't, I don't have, I mean, I've looked into to many systems, but nothing seems to be perfect. Um, you know, and still requires a lot of on-site AV support. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's something that I'm struggling with still, but I'd, I'd really love to crack. Okay, so vendors listening, please reach <laughs> out <Yeah>. to Kelsey Boyle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think it, it is that, that struggle of really making those who are virtual feel like they're a part of it. And I, I think augmented reality might be the way to do it. And there's not many places that are out there doing it. And I read these articles about, you know, what's what's trending there in that space for events. And I think that that's something that's really exciting that we're going to see in the next five to 10 years. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know if, you know, you're, you're going to attend event just by putting on a pair of glasses and then you're there. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I think it's exciting. And I think that there's definitely more to come on that. You can never leave your couch and have amazing <laughs> exactly see the world. <laughs> I, I still well, make the case for in person. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. exactly. There is yes. There, I I agree. There's nothing like it. Awesome. Well, we always like to end our sessions with just a couple of questions, and one of which is, if you could only pick one, what would be your one tip for event planners walking away from today's podcast? Megan, can we start with you? Sure. Um, I think it's, it's just to be flexible. Um, it's just to be adaptable. And I think that if you have gotten into the events industry, you very quickly learn that that's what you have to be. Um, it's, it's very much like a, a swan on top and paddling mad like a duck underneath. Um, I think we all can relate to that. But that would be my one, my one piece of advice. <laughs> awesome. Kelsey, what about you? I think I'm going to go back to listen. Uh, I think it's so easy uh, to scour Pinterest and to go to other really exciting events like a South by and want to do everything. But I think nonprofits especially need to find their sweet spot and really dig into it uh, in a way. If you, if you don't know, if you keep getting distracted by how much you can offer rather than what's your really defining factor, do the surveying, listen to your audience, listen to their, their true needs and, and what can you offer that others don't and just dig into it. Awesome. So have you two been utilizing any kind of apps, reading new books, any kind of fun gadgets that you would want to leave as a takeaway for our listeners today? What do you I think? feel I feel so uh, <laughs> I feel like there's probably greater tools out there than the ones I'm using. But I will say uh, this week we're starting to use SurveyMonkey Apply for, uh, for for all of our applications, which I think is a really great system. It's new for SurveyMonkey. It's it's been really effective in um, in us organizing different judging criteria and being being able to. Um, to have multiple people act as judges and have a grading rubric. It's, it's just been phenomenal. And then um, I, for program or for project management, I always use Smartsheet. Um, I really love it. Uh, and for helpful hints, um, I'm always finding myself on Whole Whale University, uh, which is digital marketing tactics. Uh, so those are some of mine that come to mind. Awesome. Megan, what about you? 
Um, so I, I would say that what I've learned in all of these uh, events that I've done is that the most memorable, most memorable events have the best stories and the best storytelling. So I'm big into storytelling podcasts and, you know, This American Life is an oldie but a goodie. Um, I enjoy it every week. <laughs> And there's a new one that I've discovered, um, which is quite fun, and it's called Story Pirates. And what they do is they take kids' stories and they make, you know, they have professional actors and um, and singers and improv artists take those stories and make them something really wonderful to show the kids just how amazing they are. So um, I, you know, um, and and StoryCorps, of course, as well. So as far as like podcasts that are not really in the event realm, but I think have helped me just sort of think about, you know, like, wh what is the story that we're telling here with this event? And how can we better tell it? Um, and, and this isn't like a new high tech gadget or anything, but the Apple Watch has changed my life. And <laughs> I feel like I just need to sing the praises of it just, you know, being being mindful of when it's time to stand, move around, take a breath. I think that's all important stuff for event planners to, uh, you know, to listen in on and learn because um, you can you can very easily get too into your work <laughs> and need to be that gentle reminder. That gentle buzz of the watch. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I want to extend a sincere and big thank you for both of you to take the time to talk about the world of nonprofit planning. Really appreciate hearing your insights today and appreciate everyone who tuned in live and on Facebook and at send in your questions. It was so great to hear from all of you all. And just a reminder that hashtag event icons is recorded live every single Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. And you can actually watch the behind the scenes on Facebook Live. I don't know if some of you got to see us setting up today, but we love it. And it is each episode is released the following Tuesday on iTunes, Pocket Cast, Stitcher, literally whatever your favorite podcast app is, we are there. And of course, you can visit, visit event-icons.com that you can you get the show notes and links to resources shared today. But the best way to join us is live. And we want you to sign up at event-icons.com and join the chat live on Zoom with us where we are right now. And of course, we want to know what you think. Twitter, you can use Twitter to uh, use that hashtag event icons or join the event icons Facebook group and let us know what icons you want on the show. We are all part of this really awesome global world of event planners. And the more that people we know, the better that we can do what we do. So thank you again for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you on the next hashtag event icons. Thank you and take care. Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch the transcription and all of the resources mentioned, head to www.helloendless.com slash blog. This week's episode will be posted and available by next Tuesday. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway and join the social conversation sponsored by Little Bird Told Media. Just tag your post with Hashtag Event Icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us. Joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on hashtag event icons.